This is the Wapaka County Board of Supervisors meeting. As my son would say, please take your seat to prepare for departure. Okay, I will call this meeting to order on this Tuesday, May 15th, 2018. It is 9 o'clock. And, uh, come in here ready. In 1962, President John F. Kennedy signed a proclamation which designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which that date falls as Police Week. From 2010 through 2017, 1,251 officers have died in the line of duty. Last year, 135 officers from across the United States gave their lives while protecting the communities in which they served. Among the officers that paid the ultimate sacrifice, we had two from Wisconsin. Wisconsin State Trooper Anthony Joseph Barstowsk and Detective Jason Thomas Weiland from the Everest Metro Police Department. Wisconsin State Trooper Barstowsk was killed in a single vehicle crash at mile marker 89 and I-90-94 in Sauk County. He was on patrol at approximately 4 a.m. when his patrol car left the roadway and struck a tree. It was believed that Trooper was attempting to catch up to a suspected vehicle that had been speeding when he lost control of his vehicle. Weather conditions caused the roadway to be slippery also contributed to the crash. Trooper was a member of the Wisconsin Army National Guard and had served with the State Patrol for three years. Wisconsin State Trooper Burstowski, age 34, end of watch, April 11th, 2017. Detective Weiland was shot and killed while responding to a domestic disturbance and multiple shootings. Police initially responded to a domestic disturbance call at a bank in Rothschild where two bank employees had been shot and killed. The suspect later killed an attorney at law in a law office in Schofield before barricading himself inside an apartment complex. The suspect exchanged gunfire with officers from multiple agencies at the apartment complex. Detective Weiland suffered a fatal gunshot wound before the subject was wounded and taken into custody. The suspect died of his wounds several days later. Detective Weiland was an 18-year veteran of law enforcement and had served with the Everest Metro Police Department for 15 years. He is survived by his wife and two children. Detective Weiland was age 40, end of watch, March 22nd, 2017. At this time, I would like to have a moment of silence as we remember the fallen. Arms. If you join with the pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States, States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Shoulder. Arms. Thank you. Thank you. Please be seated.
thank you to Sheriff's Department. Very touching and very fitting. Thank you very much. We have to go down to We did not finish your roll call, so we'll do roll call. Twenty-five present to excuse. Clerk, has the open meeting statement been fulfilled? Yes, it has, sir. Thank you. We have the agenda that was sent to us. Is there a motion for the agenda, please? Mr. Hendrick? I make a motion to accept the agenda. Pardon? There's a motion by Mr. Hendrick to accept. Is there a second? Supervisor Nygaard? Second. Thank you. Please cancel your request to speak. Mary Kay, could you show Jerry how to cancel? Oh. And Bill, if you want to cancel your request to speak. Bear with us as we practice our new system. <laughs> okay, we're going to call here. Is there any discussion? Okay, please vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 25 to 0. Thank you. Likewise, we have the minutes that you all went through. We will need a motion to approve the minutes. There is a motion, or uh, Supervisor Lair. I make a motion to accept the minutes. Thank you. Mr. Fleece? I'll second that motion. Thank you. Um, we do need one correction on the minutes to reflect that on the law enforcement committee, it should be uh, Dave Morak, not Bernie Ritchie. We need a separate thing. We need a motion. Yeah. Okay, well, Is someone willing to make a motion to accept those amendments, please? Whoop. <laughs> <laughs> Supervisor Lair. <laughs> I will make the motion. Okay, for the motion changes. by Supervisor Lair to make the change. There's a second. Oops. Mr. Murphy? I second that motion. Second by Gerald Murphy. Any questions or discussion? Let's vote. Uh, just a second. <laughs> Sorry, I have to get that. There. There you go. So, have we cancel this all out? No, let's just see. Got it? Sometimes when you, when you leave, you just, are you okay? okay? Can you go and then you can finish voting? So why did it? Oh, here, why did she get Oh, I go through this. But mine's okay. I am now two that I went to. How did you go back? I hit I hit the home button and then I went to the capital. Houston, we have a problem. <laughs>
Well, we'll have a flat tire now and then. We didn't even do that. You're right. There you go. Spares. Okay, last chance to vote. And um, Jan, could you just turn off your request to speak button? It's kind of like lowering your hand, otherwise, it'll show on the thing. Get the yellow one. Okay, motion carries 25 to 0 to um, pass the amended minutes. Okay, we'll go on to the ordinances slash amendments of the general code of ordinance. A. A. Amend Chapter 32, Opaca County Shoreland Protection Ordinance. Listed amendments can be obtained in the county clerk's office or the planning and zoning office. Please, Ryan. Discussion period. Do we have a motion? <coughs> let's let's do a motion then on the amendments. Okay, Ms. Fredwitz. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I make a motion to approve uh, the amendment to Chapter Thirty Two. Thank you. Is there a second? Mr. Nygaard. I will second. I'm sorry, you got the wrong one here. Here we go, Mr. Nygaard. Oh, okay, I'll second that. The second by Mr. Nygaard. You want to explain now? Yeah, I'll go through some quick uh, changes that we had made to the Shoreland uh, Ordinance. Um, a lot of what we were doing was based on clarification that we received from the DNR, um, as well as recent legislation, most notably Act 68. Um, so in, a, in section, I guess I'll just go through some of the highlighted areas here. Um, in section 12.3 on the bottom here, uh, this, is, this is a clarification that we received from the DNR saying that this would be a good idea to put into our ordinance, essentially clarifying what we are calling a vertical expansion and what we're not. Um, and that we, change, we use that same language in multiple other sections, section 13.1. Um, and also, uh, we included uh, in 13.12, that was, that was brought on because of Act 68 from uh, the recent legislation that basically is saying that um, purpose of replacing or reconstructing a structure with walls that was authorized by a variance granted before July 13th, the footprint shall not be expanded by closing the area that's located within the horizontal plane of the exterior wall to the eaves projected to a natural grade. That comes straight out of what we had on statute. 13.2, um, we included some language again, clarification from the DNR talking about the statute limitations of 10 years. Uh, we included in 13.21, conflict interpretation. That's from the, the model ordinance we received from, uh, from the DNR and the other thing that we included is some additional definitions in the back on section 18.2, uh, parent 24, 32, 33, 34, 35, and 36, basically including definitions for maintain, rebuild, repair, replace, restore, and remodel. Is there any questions on the proposed changes to the Shoreland Ordinance? 
questions or discussion? None. So please vote. Supervisor Johnson, could you just cancel your respect? Supervisor Murphy, Supervisor Zog, could you please vote? Sorry, Jerry, that was my fault. I clicked the wrong one. That was all me. You can vote again. You should vote twice anyway. <laughs> Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. I have marked um, Supervisor Zog absent. Thank you. Item B, amend chapter 34, Opaca County Zoning Ordinance. Listed amendments can be obtained in the county clerk's office and also the planning and zoning office. Is there a motion for approval? Supervisor Johnson? I move to approve. Thank you. Mr. Nygaard? Second it. Thank you. Technical difficulties, just a moment, please. It's not letting me mark the motion. And who is the second? Mr. Nygaard. Thank you. There you go. Discussion. Okay. Uh, amending table four. This is our farm preservation table. These items in this no longer apply. So we're taking those out, uh, but we are adding on a footnote number 11, saying that the minimum lot size shall be measured exclusively the road right away. It's defined in section 2.02, parent 40 of the tax only subdivision ordinance. That's for the clarifying. That's how we already uh, measure our. Yeah. Okay, oh, turn his mic on. <laughs> Sorry, Ron. There we go. <laughs> Uh, we're amending table four, uh, making some changes to uh, commercial entertainment. No, we're no longer calling it indoor commercial entertainment. We're taking out the indoor and we're, it's now it's now just referred to as commercial. Uh, outdoor recreation active is now going to, instead of it being, we're taking out the public. Um, we're renaming temporary events to now saying special events. And we're also changing it to, instead of greater than uh, 200 people, it was, uh, 750 it's now 200 and uh, less than 200 we're adding in a district a uh, private reception venue we included our definition of junk we had this in our in our section our actual junk section we're actually putting it in with the rest of our definitions uh, we're including a definition for substantial evidence that's based on act 67 um, we're exempting out some walkways and sidewalks of five feet, five feet or less in width and driveways, uh, trails, pathways, walkways, sidewalks are in, designed and intended for public use are also going to be exempted. Um, town roads, this is something that we're, we're changing to say that an access servicing five existing principal structures or servicing five or more lots will hereby be designated as a level three highway, whereas before it was tied to our E911 addressing ordinance where it went back to the, the third principal structure. Now it's going to be going to the fifth principal structure or the fifth lot being serviced by that road. Uh, where we worked with the highway department and how we're handling uh, measuring our setbacks. Uh, right now, level one highways, which is our state federal highways, we're going to be measuring it straight off of the right of way. So it's now going to be 50 feet from the right of way line. Uh, level two highways or county highways are going to be 75 feet from the marked center line or 42 from the right of way, whichever is greater. 
and for level three highways, we're gonna be measuring 63 feet from the center of the travel path. Some of these don't have marked center lines, so whatever the travel path is, we're gonna cut the middle and measure from there. Um, we changed the uh, uh, section 2.10, parent three. We took out the issuance of a certificate of compliance. That's not something that we do. Uh, instead, it's within six months of occupancy, including the repair, maintenance, renovation, rebuilding, remodeling. Uh, took out the restoration. It's just referring to as uh, expansion. Uh, discontinuous, we're adding in the fact that there's, it's not just a structure, it's also referring to the premise itself. Uh, we're redefining accessory structures now when it comes to the um, setbacks of any yard and not just the front or side yard. Um, also saying that it'd be less than 200 square feet in area and located in the rear yard can be located seven and a one half feet from the property line instead of shall be located seven and a half feet from the property line. Uh, we're including all structures must meet the required setbacks as specified on table four. Uh, we're just adding that as further clarification. We already have that in within our yard regulations. We're just including that as an additional clarification. Um, and again, with like I was saying with the uh, exemptions, we're talking about walkways and sidewalks that are five feet or less and uh, with and driveways. Also, we're exempting trail, trails, pathways, walkways, sidewalks are designed and intended for public use. Essentially, if you were to have like a walking trail, that's a walking trail that exists within the Highway 22 uh, right of way. That's something that we're, we're specifically exempting now within our ordinance to say that you can have walkways and pathways within uh, right of ways. Or if for, our, for our sake, there's, it's exempted for land use permits. Uh, we, we reworked home occupation major, complete overhaul. Uh, I won't go through and reread that all to you, but we completely re reworked and reorganized that. Bed and breakfast establishment. What we did with that was we made ourselves consistent with the existing administrative code, which is the same administrative code that Jed Walt uses. So it made sense to us that we have the exact same definition. How we are regulating bed and breakfast is the same way that um, public health is. We included a new uh, example for long-term outdoor display and sale of used car sales. Uh, in vehicle sales and service, we included in our def another example of walk-in and not just drive-in or drive-up, drive-through. Uh, we're also including food trucks or retail vehicles greater than 30 calendar days. Uh, and like I had previously mentioned uh, with the commercial entertainment, we're no longer calling that indoor. It's just commercial entertainment. We're seeing a lot more and more of outdoor uh, beer gardens. Uh, so that would include indoor and outdoor. So we're including also in our definition of that examples of banquet hall slash beer garden. Minor indoor institutional. This is something that we had made a change to. Uh, we're adding in that special events held on a property containing any of the above listed uses shall be permitted. The idea being that if you have a minor in indoor institutional use that's already established, any special events held on that property as associated with that event would be considered permitted. Outdoor public recreation, uh, we had those in two sections. We took that out of the, uh, the first section. We already had that in the active. Um, again, we're taking out the public on that, so it's just outdoor recreation active. Uh, we're including uses may include building or structure supporting the principal use, such as equipment storage sheds, shelters, restrooms, concession stands, grandstands. Um, and amending section 6.09, parent four, this is something that we have also completely reworked. Uh, our temporary events, we're now referring to them as special events. So, if you have an organized indoor outdoor assembly of less than 200 people held off site of an in indoor institution, as described in section 6.08, parents 6 and 7. Uh, this would include auctions, church festivals, large community events, municipal events, open to the public. It also includes weddings, family reunions, anniversaries, similar events. Uh, these activities shall not be permitted for more than two, uh, one time in a four-week period. So it's based on an interval now. 
So the idea being that if we were to have two special events of 200 people or more, they would be sending a letter out saying that we'd work with them to see whether or not it's actually a, a commercial business or if it's just happened to be a coincidence that they have to happen to have two very large family events in a close proximity to each other. We're changing uh, section 6.10 parents who, uh, parents see uh, for uh, horse keeping, property owners must provide a shelter for horses with a minimum of three walls and a horse in uh, a roof where that's one of the things that we're just clarifying is something we've always included. We're not no longer going to be using the, um, that good horse uh, practice, uh, best practice manual. That's the only thing that we've always been enforcing is the shelter for horses with a minimum of three walls and a roof anyway. Uh, On-site egg retail, uh, we are clarifying that it needs to be on a participating farm and not just on a single farm. Uh, the idea being that if it's going to be a, a farmer's market of some variety that it's on an actual participating farm. Then uh, there's that private reception venue that we are now including uh, new. So, um, so this will be used for weddings, corporate events, fundraisers, anniversary celebrations. The term also includes event barns with special standards being, need a minimum of five acres. Um, it must meet all applicable local state building codes. Uh, all licenses approvals must be obtained by other county departments, including but not just limited to the health department and the sheriff's office. Proper sanitary facilities must be provided. And the required parking is one space for every three patrons, or one space for every three persons. That... <laughs> oh, there we go. Um, we're including with the 10 acres for the consolidation of farm structures with township approval. Uh, we've already had that before. We're just including that in another section. Um, non, no non-farm residential or commercial development. That's something with, with our, our farm preservation. We do allow for commercial development. Uh, we're in, they're professional land surveyors rather than registered land surveyors. We're making that change. And then in sections 1403, 3B1, if a property has multiple structures requiring a variance, it shall require separate variance applications with separate fees. And uh, then we're including on to uh, section 14.4.3b3 uh, that we do always hold on-site inspections for all the properties involved with our Board of Adjustment public hearing. And we also included the, the public, hearing uh, public hearing language that we already have in the ordinance saying that a notice of the hearing to the town board chair and clerk of the affected town and the owners of the record of properties which are located within 300 feet to the parcel involved in the application. That's a standard operation that we already have for public hearings. We're making sure that it's within the ordinance now under our board of adjustment. The 1405 is a planning and zoning committee. Again, we're putting in the, the, that information about the on-site inspections. We do hold uh, inspections for all that, for all of our um, uh, planning and zoning hearings. And then we include it as conditional use permit review criteria. This is straight out of Act 67. Um, and then the, and further on to the imposition of conditions, we added in some language. Uh, Pratt, if, it went, if it's um, conditions imposed as a part of a condition as permanent shall be achievable, practical, and to the extent possible, measurable. Any condition imposed must be related to the purpose of the ordinance and be based on substantial evidence. Again, that's from Act 67. In uh, 1405.1c1, this is what uh, we notice is that our public hearing notice, and we're also saying that no fewer than 10 days prior to the date of the public hearing, planning and zoning director shall mail notice of the hearing to the town board chair and clerk of the affected town, again with the 300 feet all the way around, the same language that we have for our uh, notices for public hearings. Uh, 1405.2d. We're adding it again, on-site inspections. And for a town initiated multiple rezones within the town, there'll be no on-site inspections conducted. Some of the rezones that we have will be, we'll have 100 properties associated with it. We're not gonna do on-sites for all of them. So we just have, it just goes straight to the hearing. Um, we took out the, in a timely manner to unlawful to apply for a, a, and obtain permits. 
Uh, it's hard for us to really define in a, law, a timely manner. A lot of sometimes land use permits can take some time. Some are quick, some may take a little bit longer. And it's not a fault of the applicant. There could be other things, extenuating circumstances, like say a surveyor schedule that come into play. <laughs> Uh, 14073A, uh, we're including in an effort to verify compliance that a survey map may be required at the landowner expense. If it happens that we need, to, if it's required, if there's putting on a structure that's close to a setback that we need to verify, a survey may be required. That's why we're including that. Uh, um, we're adding to Appendix B the animal density unit standards that an animal not provided on Appendix B, which is our um, are, are the standard form that we receive from DADCAP for all our uh, to measure animal units. If it's not listed on that on that that list that we get from DADCAP, we will then look at it as being a thousand pounds of live weight equivalent to one animal unit. The reason why we're including this is that we have some interesting niche animals in this county that aren't on that list. So now we're just looking at whatever the live weight is. That's going to be based on a thousand as animal units. That takes care of it for the zoning ordinance. Is there any questions on our proposed changes? Supervisor Craig. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I would like to say for the new supervisors that don't, um, that haven't gone through this process, that this zoning covers all the unincorporated, in other words, the rural areas of Opaka County. And I appreciate that the zoning department sends to the townships um, notice of these changes along with the opportunity to come to their public hearings. And I think Ryan will agree that they read these very closely. And I want to say I appreciate um, the flexibility of listening and then changing and then continuing to make our ordinances what we need them to be. As an example, um, the special events where it came down to one in any four week period. There was quite the discussion on what does it mean and how are you going to handle it? And I think you've handled that very well. And the other one towns were concerned about was having the level three highways. And sometimes it's education and understanding what does this really mean because zoning can be very complicated. So I would like to compliment the zoning on bringing this forth and knowing that this will not be the last one that we see, that you're continually looking at our zoning regulations and seeing where we need to improve them or make them more efficient. Or if the state tells us what to do, we also have to change them. So thank you. Any other questions or discussion for Ryan? Supervisor Zog, did you need to speak? Your, your speak button is on or no? No other questions? Okay, we will vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 25 to zero. Thank you. Muck, you had a question? No. Okay, item C. Amend Chapter 37, Wapaka County Subdivision Ordinance. Listed amendments can be obtained in the County Clerk's Office and the Planning and Zoning Office. Oh, I, yeah, I'm sorry. Need a motion? <laughs> Mr. Fedowitz. Mr. Chairman, I so move uh, for amend chapter 37. There is a motion for approval by Mr. Federowitz. Mr. Hendrick? I'll second that. And a second by Mr. Hendrick. Uh, questions? Vote. Oh. I'm sorry. Oh, I, That's right. No. <laughs> That's all right. Speeding me up. Sorry, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> so for the, the sale exchanges, we're including a clarifying statement to say that 
if you're going to be doing a sale or exchange, you cannot make any uh, any lots are made more non-conforming in terms of their dimension. This comes out of a, a, a statute that, that already exists, where it's adding in that additional clarification. Um, and the next three sections, amending 5.01, 6.01, 7.01, uh, we're referring to them as professional land surveyors rather than registered land surveyors. That's a recent change that's being made. Uh, section 7.01, parent 6, on the setback notes, we're now just we're telling the surveyors to just say on their certified survey maps for the building setbacks, contact the planning and zoning office, rather than having them put, try to put the setbacks on the actual certified survey map themselves. Just have them contact our office, and it will, will then help in terms of where the setbacks are. Um, we're adding in setback distance. Any new land divisions must be shown on a map to any existing structures, the new parcel line. The idea of this is that we have some land divisions where we're creating parcel lines right between structures. We want to make sure that we can still legally do that while not creating non-conforming structures. Uh, setbacks to highways shall be measured in accordance with section 2.081 of the Pack County Zoning Ordinance. That's a section I just previously talked about, about how we measure, how we're measuring setbacks. Um, uh, 8.02, parent 11, newly created roads. Again, we're just changing professional land surveyor uh, instead of registered land surveyor. Under section 8.07, parent three, access. This is in correlation to the change that we had just made in the zoning ordinance, uh, referring to it no longer being going to the third principal structure based on the E91 addressing standard. It's now gonna be based on five existing structures or servicing five or more lots which is consistent what we already have or what we call for a, a subdivision. And then uh, in section 8.07, parent six, minimal lot sizes shall be measured exclusive of the road right of way as we already have defined in uh, section 2.02, parent 40. That's our changes for subdivision. Any questions? Please vote. Supervisor Handress and Nightguard, can you turn off your request to speak, please? Oh, oh. oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Nightguard? Uh, thank you. Uh, the exclusive of road right away, uh, that doesn't affect the tax description. The description for the property taxes would still go to the center line if it's a town road. Um, is that correct? Certainly. It, yeah. It's just. Yeah. It's just for how the way we measure lot area is exclusive of the right away, but that's not affecting the actual legal description for the right. Parcel, absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, we got to finish voting, please. Last chance to vote. Motion carries twenty five to zero. Thank you. Uh, item D, 2018-652, amendment to chapter 34, petition number Z-009-18, town of Lind, Donald W. Polk, for a zoning map amendment from PVRF district to AE district on approximately 34.3 30 acres. Is there a motion, please? Oh, got to look here. Motion by Mr. Knight. Oops. Mr. Nygaard? Mr. Chairman, I move to approve. Okay, there's a motion by Mr. Nygaard. Uh, Supervisor Lair? I second it. <coughs> and we have a second by Supervisor Lair. There we go. Supervisor Lair and Zog, if you, unless do you have a question, you can turn off your request to speak. Uh, yeah, so Mr. Pope is looking to do this rezone because he has an existing hunting parcel and he'd like to acquire some of the neighboring par neighboring land. And in order for him to do that, he needs the, that parcel to be the same zoning district as the adjacent parcel. What he's planning on doing is a sale or exchange with the, the adjacent parcel. So that's why this, this rezone is required. Discussion? Supervisor Ritchie? 
That parcel is currently, agri or I mean forestry, isn't it? And it's zoned forestry. Why would we, at this point, take that land and put it into agricultural if he's going to be using it primarily for recreational and hunting? Because it would still be used within the egg enterprise, so he wouldn't change in terms of use. So what it would be is, in order for him to be able to buy it and incorporate it into his property, we can't. It has to be the same zoning district. We don't. We don't allow one parcel having two zoning districts. So it's to. It's really to make sure that so he has the ability to take in a neighboring parcel, a hunting parcel. So it wouldn't actually change his actual use, and it would be also. And it's also consistent with the Talents Comp plan. Um, agricultural then is that uh, hunting I mean is that forestry that he's in his current parcel is that forestry or is that agricultural that he's into so the current parcel is it's zoned PVRF and he's rezoning it to Aga Aga Enterprise correct but is it I guess what I'm asking is the parcel that he's purchasing is um, forestry that's right and his uh, parcel that he currently owns is agricultural. Is that actually agricultural land that he has, or is that um, forestry land that he actually has? The majority of that land is actually or forested or being used for hunting, or for recreational hunting. I guess my question, or what I'm trying to get at, is what is the tax difference going to be from um, recreational? Um, forestry to agricultural, um, the value of the um, land and what what benefits is going to be to uh, the taxpayers to rezone this. Sure. So the, <clears throat> the, the, the base zoning district doesn't have any effect on the taxation or the assessment. Under use value assessment, it's based on how the property is being used rather than the base zoning district. So whether it's in a PVRF or private forestry or ag enterprise, it would have any effect on uh, property taxes. Okay, thank you. You bet. <coughs> Supervisor Ellis. Oh, uh, whatever that's on there, I, I don't think I touched it. Okay. <laughs> okay. You're showing us wanting to speak here on this matter. That's why you call that. <laughs> Mr. Smith? Just so I understand correctly, I don't want to rezone this and open the door up for later a, an appeal that this is actually egg land rather than uh, forest land. I, I just I feel as though by doing this, you open up a door for an opportunity. And, and have, having just gone through a major tax appeal, within my municipality, I, I, I guess I don't understand the justification. He, this is forested land, he's gonna use it for hunting. I understand that it's best use and current use. However, I, is there a possibility that the door will be opened up for him to come forward with a tax appeal now and say, this is actually zoned agriculture and I should be taxed accordingly? No, I, again, the, the, the base zoning district doesn't have any effect on the assessment. It's based on uh, use value. Uh, for instance, we have some properties that are zoned commercial, but they're being taxed agricultural because they're taking cuttings of hay off them. It's based off the use value, not the base zoning district. So there wouldn't be a, you know, similar to what we're seeing with like a dark store situation. You know, we're not, that's not a situation that we would be able to see in this. Because this is, we're not changing, we're, we're, all we're doing is changing the base zoning district, which does not have an effect on use value assessment or the assessment codes that that property would have. So he wouldn't be able to go back and say that, you know, it's, it's agriculture. I mean, when the assessor goes out there, if he's using that land primarily for agriculture, then he'll be assessed accordingly. And a, a, agriculture is an approved use in both districts. So it's possible in both. Any other questions? Mr. Nygaard? Jill, could you pull that map up again, that aerial map? There. OK. Uh, Ryan, can you explain what, what's being added and what he owns now on that screen? So this is what he, 
this is what he owns here anyway my understanding is he's looking to buy this property so he, what he's trying to do is he's trying to he's having this rezone to be the same district as this so that he can change the parcel lines to incorporate that into so he can own that as well uh, any other questions let's vote okay Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, Mr. Ritchie, could you turn off your request to speak? Thank you. There you go. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 22 to 3. Okay, we're already down to resolutions. Uh, A is resolution number six, 2018 19, budget amendment, jail improvements. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the following transfer be made from the jail improvement, improvement restricted fund for video monitors and cameras. Transfer from the fund balance restricted jail improvement 70,000 to the correction outlay. Supervisor Craig. Motion to approve resolution number six. There is a motion by Supervisor Craig Oops. for approval. Sorry, just Pat, if, if you went off, it's because I accidentally hit the wrong key, so you should come back on. I did it, I'm sorry. I said it already. No, 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 I hit the wrong key on your on your pie pad if something shows up differently. That it should be back on. It's fine. Okay. Mr. Murphy. I, sec I second the motion to the j for the jail improvement fund. There's a second by Gerald Murphy for the jail improvement fund. Any discussion? Discussion? Yes, Mr. Bosquez. Oh. Did you, okay. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, the, the first line uh, of that where it says, uh, not anticipated at the time of establishing the 2018 budget. Um, I have a little bit of an issue with that. Uh, back in 2016, there was a security study done that uh, recommended the camera up be updated for the courthouse, and those cameras are monitored by uh, jail staff. So back in 2016, we should have known that there was an um, issue that could have been incorporated with those two things. Um, also, uh, the fingerprint equipment that they're talking about, there was issues with that before I even retired back in uh, 2017. So I think uh, these two, this type of uh, um, expenditures would be better served uh, coming in through regular budget process um, so that we could uh, incorporate more than just the jail perhaps or there's more ideas, more discussion on it. Um, so. Uh, with that in mind, I recommend a no vote for this. The 2016 crisis reality report that you reference was the courthouse only and didn't consider the jail. Uh, I understand that, but it, it should have put it on everybody's radar is what I'm saying, is that we should have had a better plan in place within the last two years. Mr. Jolie, are you asking to speak? I would just like to reiterate that uh, this is going to provide a lot less congesting in the booking area. And I, I think uh, our sheriff or our jail captain could explain that a lot better if uh, the sheriff would like to speak to it. Sheriff Hardell, you want to come up? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, yes, this, this, uh, the cameras we're talking about is strictly because of the changes we're making in the booking area, uh, or I'm sorry, in the Huber area. We've taken the Hubers and we're putting them out on GPS, so we're opening up a whole new 
area uh, that will be um, better served not bringing people into the jail. Right now, when people come in to be fingerprinted, they have to be come into the secure part of the jail. And uh, so that means they have to be searched. Everything has to be turned in. This way, it'll be outside of the secure area of the jail. They can come in, be fingerprinted without going through the whole process. Uh, so th the cameras are all part of that process and also uh, updating some of the things that we've, we've had before. But when we did this study with uh, this new group, this came to light, uh, some of the things we should cover. So uh, these are all jail funds that are strictly for the jail improvement. It can't be used for courthouse or things like that. So uh, that's what it's about. Any other, any other questions? Mr. Terry Murphy? Yeah, I think what you're saying is this money was already set aside for whatever it had to be needed for, correct? Yes. All right. Anybody else? If you would like to speak, you have to press your request to speak, please. And recall the rule we have um, each supervisor is limited to two comments per motion. Yeah. And this, Thank you. This is my second, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> I'm just trying to, okay. Um, I understand that, Sheriff, uh, that it's uh, money set aside separately for the jail. Uh, I guess my issue that I'm trying to get across is that um, the courthouse could use some um, updating and stuff with their security cameras, and I'm just thinking it would be a better plan to incorporate it all at once instead of having to cobble pieces together. Um, but if that's if that's taken into account and then it, it makes it easier to integrate some new stuff since the jail monitors those cameras, that's all I'm saying is that it, the, the county would be better served with a more inclusive plan that's probably better handled at a, at a full budget type of process. Any other comments? Supervisor Jonley, or did you want to speak, or did you, your request to speak is on? No, I didn't. According to mine, it is. You just have to cancel your request to speak. Get that to Brad. Thank you. I, I just, as part of the law enforcement committee, we had a, <coughs> excuse me, we had a, a nice tour of what they want to do, the improvements they're going to make, and maybe it's a little better understood once you went through this the whole area, and I know you know, you've been there, but I certainly understand it, what they want to do, and it's for the betterment. Now, uh, all I can say as a chair is, the courthouse security is a whole other subject, and we're constantly working on that. It's a budgetary item that we have to work on, but that's a separate thing, but thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, please vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 22 to 3. Okay. Uh, resolution number 7, 2018-19, amend chapter 45 of the General Code of Ordinances, comprehensive plan. Is there a motion for a proof? Oh. Um, actually, do you think I'll Mr. Dog? I uh, would make a motion to approve that, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Mork? I would second that motion. Thank you. Motion by Zog, second by Mork. Questions or discussion? Please vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 25 to 0. Item C will be resolution number 8, 20 18 19, a contingency fund transfer. Now, therefore, be it resolved that $28,181 be transferred from the contingency fund to the maintenance department capital outlay general ledger line to fund replacement of the Identicard 9000 series hardware with the recommended Mercury hardware. 
Motion for approval, please. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Motion for approval, please. That still doesn't show what that we can Yeah, I was, but I, I got to slow down here. I'm sorry. No, it, um, I was waiting for the motion for approval. So, um, Mr. Morick. Um, Mr. Morick. So moved. There's a motion by Mr. Morick for approval. Okay. Supervisor Craig. Second. There's a second by Supervisor Craig. Discussion? Questions? Please vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 25 to 0. Thank you. At this time, we're going to take a short break. We're moving right through here really well with this busy schedule, so thank you. Okay, I guess we're all here. We'll get back on schedule or right on schedule. We'll make up more time in the sky though. It has tailwind now, so here we go. We're down to reports. Review finance policy. Number one is budget policy, and here comes Heidi, our director. Tell us all about it. Good morning. Good morning. Um, finance committee has been a little bit busy. We've been looking at some policy, um, either creations or updates, and those were in your packet. Um, in respect of your time and the reports to follow, I'm just going to kind of quickly go over some of the highlights of those policies. Um, but you know, you if you have not had a chance to review them, hopefully you get a chance to review it before the next meeting because we're hoping to get a resolution for you to adopt the policies in June. Um, the budget policy and the capital improvement policy one and four, those are new policies that we have developed. Debt management policy and fund balance policy have been policies that we've had in the past, um, but they've really never been, a, they really should be reviewed and looked at on an annual, um, on an annual basis. So those, we're going to just quickly review those and um, put that as part of that resolution in June. The budget policy um, kind of is more of a just a streamlined process, a more detailed um, budget trans, you know, what the budget is going to look like in process will be a part of the budget manual. But this is just kind of given a general idea of how we would anticipate the budget process to go. <coughs> so um, first of all, the, for, the second part, portion of the budget policy is basically what is the purpose of the budget and how is it used. Then we have our um, budget calendar. The county does, um, fiscal year does coincide with the calendar year, so it does, the budget year is January to December. So, um, and I'm not gonna read through all of these, but um, March and April would be finance committee review of previous years and kind of reviewing these policies to see if we need to update or make any changes. And then in May, I, um, we would be bringing those to the county board to reapprove those policies for the next budget process. And then in June, the departments will begin reviewing their five-year capital improvement plan. July is going to be a busy month. Um, the finance in our department will be distributing the worksheets to the departments. Um, guidelines for revenue estimates will be established. Oversight committees will be reviewing and approving departments' five-year capital improvement plan any new or expanded program areas and any new and anticipated or expanded position requests. By July 31st, it's hopefully that we, we can have the departments submitting to the finance department their five-year capital improvement plan and any of those new and expanded program requests. And then the new and expanded position requests would be submitted to the human resources department. In August, um, county departments will be reviewing their operating budget with their oversight committee while the human resources committee reviews um, the wage schedules and along with the expanded position, re newer expanded position requests. And the, five, the finance committee will be busy reviewing the five-year capital improvement plan that was submitted in July. And once that's approved, they'll bring it here to the county board for adoption and then once that capital improvement plan is adopted, the capital, the next year will be incorporated into the operating budget so we can work through that piece. 
um, September, the week one of December, this of September, um, the departments will be submitting their approved budgets to the finance department and we'll compile those budget requests and get them to the finance committee to review and um, where we'll have to make necessary changes of, um, based upon the funding levels that have been set. Oops. Wow, that's tricky. Um, in October, the reading of the budget does occur um, to the county board the last Tuesday of the month and then the county clerk has the responsibility of publishing the um, class one notice of the public hearing. Second Tuesday in November is the public hearing and after the public hearing the county board adopts the resolution uh, or adopts the annual budget resolution as presented from the finance committee and then we prepare the mill rate worksheets and the county treasurer provides property tax bills to the municipal clerks. Quick rundown of the calendar. Um, the, the budget structure is just kind of listing out how we adopt a budget. We adopt our budget by the fund and function of government at the department level and then um, by account classification after that. Some departments have um, more detailed program areas and then we detail account numbers within those classifications for better tracking of their budget. And then it lists out how the budget document will be broken into and what cat the categories that the budget document is broken into, which is what you will see as that is presented. Um, the one, this is all kind of just standard practice. The one thing that we did put in here is a budget accountability. Um, we're asking that each department monitors their annual, de their annual department budget and at a minimum report to their committee of jurisdiction their six month experience and then again, at, after the year has ended, um, how their budget performance for that year has, was maintained. Um, budget amendments, the county, the, we're, the Wisconsin Stat 6590, Prem 5, does tell us how we have to amend budgets. Um, so that any budget amendments have to be made um, at the county board with two-thirds of the entire membership um, authorizing that. The um, statute does allow for the county board to authorize the finance committee up to 10% of a department's budget or 10% of the contingency fund to, um, for those amendments, and they, those wouldn't necessarily have to come through the county board. And through this policy, we're requesting that the county board does authorize that. Um, the contingency fund for 18 is budgeted at 50,000, so 5,000 would be the most that the finance committee would be allowed at this point to amend. And then a department's budget would mean, you know, maybe moving from contracted services to supplies and expenditures, and it, that amendment would not exceed more than 10%, but it would be within an individual department. And then the, also requesting that the the finance director has authority to amend the budget um, to correct the accounting record to make it make a little more where it may not have been budgeted appropriately, but it's not the purpose of what it was adopted would not change. Um, and then any other minor line item adjustments more in the detailed account level within a classification. And then there's carryover requests. Um, basically what we're requesting is that any carryover requests within a department or to the finance department by January 31st and that the funds must be available in the department and um, it, it, the carryover is needed to finish a, a project that may not have been completed or purchase an item that was budgeted for that did not happen in that fiscal year. But the carryover cannot be for operational costs. It can only be for those um, one-off one type items that would, may still were not expended in the previous year. So that's kind of in a nutshell what that the budget policy is. Um, again, kind of you know read through it. If you have questions, we'll come back at the end if you have any questions on these policies. But that is what we have for the budget policy. The next policy is the debt management policy, and again, like I stated, we did have this um, approved back in 2010, so I'm just going to kind of go highlight some of this. Um, the debt management policy does call for a capital improvement plan. There are limitations on the county as to what, 
how we issue debt. Um, we have legal limits. Then we have the public, public policy limits. Um, the pol public policy limits states that the county will, will cash fund projects in whole or in part as, um, as an alternative to debt financing. And we will only issue debt for purchase of capital assets or to fund infrastructure improvements. And we will not issue long-term debt for operational needs. Um, it is possible in an emergency situation that we would have to issue short-term debt, but we would never issue long-term debt for anything operational. We have also financial limits. We have um, put a targeted maximum of 1.25% of direct debt burden as a percent of equalized value and $575 for direct debt burden per capita. We do um, have a targeted of repayment of no less than 80% of our payments, principal payments. We're going to, let me re-say that. The county's target of repayment of no less than 80% of outstanding principal within 10 years. Um, percentage of expenditures, our target is 9% as uh, expressed as a percentage of the sum of all operating and debt service fund expenditures within the budget. And the county's targeted tax rate for debt service is $1.50. Our debt structuring practices at the maximum term will not exceed the economic life of the improvement. Interest rates, we, um, the debt obligations will carry a fixed interest rate. Um, we will strive to target to structure the debt so that the annual principal and interest payments are level and in some cases we would wrap that in order to have um, so that we can meet that level of principal and debt service payment on an annual year that's basically so you're not seeing a huge fluctuation on your debt service payment to the taxpayers in any given year we try not to cap we can capitalize interest but we will most likely try to budget to estimate the interest expense. And then the call provisions are made short as possible with achieving the best interest rate. We do, um, our debt is issued by competitive sale. We can do a negotiated sale if the complexity of the issue requires specialized expertise. And we do have an alternative to open market financing to either take out a state and fed or federal loan, fund, or pool to fund um, if it is advantageous to do so. Refunding, um, the county can re, um, refund or re, restructure debt when it is economical, it's an economic benefit to the county. And then the credit rating, the finance director is responsible for maintaining that relationship with the rating agencies and that currently assign the county ratings to the county's debt obligation. And then the continuing disclosure, um, we are required to do that and we do follow that. We do invest our debt proceeds um, in accordance with the investment policy. Interest earnings on those debt proceeds are, are first applied to the project costs and anything above that would be used to it pay, repay off the debt in the next year. And then the arbitrage rebate and monitoring, the um, finance director is Will, does establish and maintain a system of record keeping and reporting to meet those compliance requirements of the federal tax code. That was the debt management policy in a nutshell there. We also have a fund balance policy. Um, fund balance poli the fund balance is basically the equity that the county has. Um, so this policy has been in effect and so I'm sure you've heard a lot of um, discussion in regards to that over the course of a few years. Um, but these, these are the categories based upon the governmental county standing, standards board and Wapaka County has adopted those categories. Um, Non-spendable, restricted, then we have unrestricted, which is either committed, assigned, or unassigned. Um, most significant on this slide would be that the county will maintain a minimum unassigned fund balance of 25% of operating revenues for these purposes. So um, the unassigned is the residual classification of the general fund. So that is where we will maintain the unassigned fund balance. 
the authority to restrict, restrict, commit, and assign. Restrict is, restriction is um, from an outside source. So a donor, a grantor, they will restrict those funds. Um, commitment is at the county board level. Um, the special revenue funds are committed funds and on an annual basis when you adopt the budget for the special revenue funds, you are um, essentially committing those funds for that purpose. Those funds cannot be removed from those funds unless county board action is taken to remove them and move them to a different, for a different purpose. Um, the county board has given the finance committee the authority to assign funds and for other resources that we may need. Um, one of the most significant assignages that we have is the capital improvement project um, projects. We have an assignage in the general fund to fund future capital. Um, prioritization of fund balance, this is a new um, portion of this policy. It's basically indicating that um, the county will use restricted funds when available for an expenditure. And then um, when you get to the unrestricted portion, you'll first use committed, then assigned and unassigned last, um, depending on what, as long as it fits, the expenditure fits within the category. Uh, for example, that jail improvement, those are restricted funds, um, so that we would use those funds first if it's for a jail improvement, um, and then committed, assigned, and unassigned, if that makes sense. Um, monitoring and reporting, uh, finance director is responsible for monitoring the county fund balance levels, and you will see those levels through the budget process um, reporting back to you. Where, where we are sitting in each of these classifications and um, any recommendations to use an overage and an unassigned fund balance to either pay for debt or capital instead of using it, instead of levying for those um, expenditures. And then replenishment. Um, if the unassigned fund balance does fall behind under that 25% threshold, the county board will have to approve a plan to restore the balance within 24 months unless that brings on a severe hardship to the county. Um, then you would have to establish a longer time frame, but as quickly as possible in order to restore that to the 25%, um, as that 25% of signage. Now we're to the capital improvement plan policy. Um, this is, again, like I said, a, a new policy that we've um, put into place. This is trying to help um, feed back into that budget policy where we can have a strong capital improvement plan. We anticipate this plan to be a five-year um, plan. And, um, and hopefully we can, this will help us make really strong decisions in, for future purchases of capital. Um, we're, the, ca the definition or what, where the capital improvement plan would be a non-recurring expense in nature, and that the lifespan would be at least five years for, for the, um, what is put into the plan. Uh, it would consist of land acquisition, um, construction of buildings, or, or construction of new replacement infrastructure, such as roads, culverts, um, equipment, such as individual vehicles and major computer software systems, and then soft costs related to anything one through five. Uh, your legal costs, engineering costs, architectural design costs. We, there is a system that we've established to prioritize these projects. Level one projects are high priority and they're in the health and safety or maintenance replacement category. The level three projects are either medium priority and they are, or, and they are in the new program criteria or they are low priority or in the expansion of an existing program. And then all other projects under the matrix that it has been implemented, those would be identified as a level two project, which will help us prioritize as we move through it um, as to how, which projects should be shifted out if we cannot afford to do them in the given year that they've been assigned to. As far as the process is concerned, um, it'll, the county departments will it will begin with a request from the county departments to put in modification, updates, additions as part of the budget process. And as I stated in the budget policy, that will be due to us um, in the finance department by July 31st. 
And those, those submissions, when they come to the finance department, the committee of jurisdiction should have approved them and identified, um, approved the plan along with the prioritization of, that, of those projects. We're requesting that each department maintain an annual vehicle and equipment listing with an anticipated replacement year and replacement cost for items greater than 25,000 as part of their annual CIP. So it'll be kind of a two, two-fold process. And then once the Committee of Jurisdiction has approved those, those would move on to the Finance Department, which we would incorporate into one five-year plan. The Finance, yeah, it's on that paragraph. Um, and then once we've incorporated those into a five-year plan, we would present that to the Finance Committee. The Finance Committee will then um, prioritize based on, on funding and approve the five-year plan to be submitted to the County Board here for final approval. And then by, that will be adopted annually by resolution. And, and then upon adoption, that first year of the plan will be incorporated into the annual budget. And so when you approve that plan here at this level, I'm anticipating in October, then we'll incorporate it through that September process. And then October, you would have already seen that plan. I went through that very fast. <laughs> And I know that. So um, if you have questions or comments, I, again, um, prior to the next meeting, you can either reach out by, to me by phone or by email. And then, like I had stated, that the, we'll be forwarding a resolution to adopt these policies at the June 19th meeting, but felt it was important to give you some, some little feedback as to some of the highlight pieces of those policies. And that's okay. all I have. Any immediate questions? I just wanted to tell our new our newcomers that they are welcome at the finance uh, budget meetings. Is that correct? And so they can, if they have an issue or something they want to talk about, they can come to the meetings. Thank you. That's a good point, uh, Supervisor Boyer. We do have some supervisors that come to our finance meetings, which is usually the second Wednesday of the month. Uh, the, the, to listen and to monitor what we're doing. And uh, there was a open meeting, so you're free to listen in. Bob, did you want to speak? Okay. We're showing you this morning. Oh, my. Oh, there. <laughs> we took it off. Nobody else wants to speak, apparently. Uh, yeah. 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 So, Dave Mark, let me, let me see if my connection is... is yeah, our, our computer isn't recognizing Dave. <laughs> but now we can speak. Okay. Uh, okay. I speak. Okay. No, I was just curious. Uh, my first question was on the budget. Uh, schedule, I do not see the county board providing direction all the way through. Basically, they're just approving. They do not, before the budget process or in the early budget process, they do not provide direction, for example, as to how much spending could increase. <coughs> no, that has not been part of the policy. That is not part of the policy right now. <coughs> Anybody else? Jim, did you press? Yeah, I did. Yes. Mr. Nygaard? Okay. Uh, maybe you could explain how the committees uh, get the budgets approved at a committee level and then it's presented as a bunch to the, as an entire collection of committee approvals to the board for approval. You know what, Mr. Nygaard? That's a good point. But it's going to take a while because I'd like to, again, in the new supervisors meeting we had, I kind of explain how we've done this in recent years. So maybe in spite of time, we've got lots of things to go. Yep. Next month, I'll mention it 
in my report how this all came about, okay? Thank you. Good point. Okay. We'll put this report on file in the clerk's office. Thank you. Okay, now we have Mr. Greg Blonde, UW Extension Impact Report. Uh, good morning. Uh, the impact report is on your desk uh, with some blue uh, headers. The uh, staff in our UW Extension Department, uh, at least the educators, are identified in that blue box in the upper left-hand corner. I um, would also like to recognize our, our committee. Our chairman is uh, Daryl Hondrick. Um, the committee also includes uh, Mr. Bob Ellis, Mr. Jim Nygaard, Mr. Dick Rowan, and uh, Mr. Bernie Ritchie. I would also like to recognize and thank Mr. David Newman, who uh, has been on our committee for a number of years and, and now has moved on to bigger and better things, but we sure appreciate uh, his support in the past as well. And I think it's also important, and I, we need to we need to revise this uh, quarterly report to include our support staff uh, because without them, uh, we're nothing. Uh, that includes uh, Dana Nelson, uh, Annette Stralo, and uh, Sherry Wisey, our three support staff. Uh, Sherry, we, we actually share with Land and Water and in a little bit, I think, this summer with uh, planning and zoning as they're looking at it. Uh, short time staffing challenge so we sure appreciate all of our support staff uh, as well I'm not going to take much time you can read and I'd encourage you to read this uh, again this is quarterly this is what we call our spring extension report uh, starting on the back side uh, you've got an update from our uh, family living educator uh, Sandy Ling about a, an award-winning financial management program that she is working on this summer with area libraries uh, including displays, workshops, uh, and really trying to help both kids as well as parents uh, focus in on saving and, and budgeting and, and what a difference that can make. If you look at that graphic on the back uh, page with that piggy bank, uh, it's, it's pretty amazing that even as little as uh, $500 or less in a child's savings account, uh, greatly increases the likelihood of uh, doing better in high school uh, and also uh, participating in college. So that's something Sandy's going to be working on uh, this summer uh, in several different communities in the libraries. Um, on page three, um, you can see uh, Penny Tank, our uh, longtime 4-H uh, uh, educator was recently recognized at a, at a statewide conference as uh, one of the uh, colleagues of the year. Uh, Penny has stepped up uh, within the 4-H uh, educators across the state and, and really um, picking up some of the vacancy uh, that have occurred with uh, retirements and transition going on in extension. So congratulations to Penny. Uh, at the bottom of page three, uh, just last week, um, we had the 18th Leadership Wapaka County class graduate. Uh, that, those 15 graduates now bring us over 300 uh, Leadership Wapaka County participants uh, that have gone through the program. Initially started by uh, Tom Wilson um, 18 years ago. So, uh, by the way, if you know anybody that might be interested or you think is a good candidate for the Leadership Wapaka County, uh, our office will be taking um, those registrations uh, this summer. Uh, the first class, it's a monthly class uh, workshop series, full day workshop, moves around the county uh, every month, September through May. So if you know anybody that might be uh, interested, have them give uh, Jessica Beckendorf, our community uh, development educator, a call. On page two are our food wise and farm to school educators. Uh, Christy, Kelly, and, and Michelle highlight some of the work that they're doing. Uh, Christy and Kelly are going to be working in Wapaka with the uh, uh, farm market here in Wapaka to um, uh, try to help expand that market. Um, not only does it have uh, obvious nutritional benefits, 
by expanding a local farm market, but it also has some tourism value um, as well. Uh, one of the things they're going to be working on, in addition to, uh, they've secured a grant and are going to be hiring a market manager to, to focus a little bit more time and effort in that regard, but they're also going to be looking at electronic transfers, electronic payment, so that families that have uh, the um, food-wise and women and in infant and children can use those uh, dollars uh, in fresh vegetable purchases. Um, that's an important aspect to overall nutrition and, and that's what they're going to be working on uh, this year. And Michelle um, uh, Burrington is going to be wrapping up. She's a one-year uh, grant funded position, our farm to school program uh, this summer. She's, this past school year she's been working in the school uh, systems around the uh, county, specifically with fourth graders, helping them identify um, better uh, eating habits um, because unfortunately it's not like it used to be. Um, you can't always count on mom and dad to be teaching those things at home these days. That brings me to the front cover uh, and that's why I'm up here uh, just so you know whoever uh, we have a rotation in the office whoever uh, is responsible for the for the front cover gets the uh, the opportunity to come and share with you um, the entire uh, report. Um, uh, Chairman Keppen has been after me for a while about giving an update on agriculture in Wapaka County <laughs> and I keep telling him you know the Ag Census, the federal census which was completed uh, in uh, December, actually January of this year, our county results uh, won't be available uh, probably until later this summer. I'll be back I promise uh, next uh, winter probably with more uh, comprehensive update. But when you talk about the status of agriculture, um, one of the best ways to look at where we stand is what's land value, where, because that underpins uh, agriculture regardless of the enterprise, dairy, grain, vegetables, you name it. So what I did, uh, there was a recent uh, evaluation of, of land sales by one of our extension specialists at Madison, uh, Arlen Brandstrom. And Arlen went back and looked at uh, the real estate transfer data that uh, our uh, register of deeds submit all across the state in each county. Then what Arlen did was he, he factored out any of those trans transfers or those sales that had buildings or improvements, wanted just bare ag land sales, he also factored out any financially distressed sales, so we weren't looking at foreclosures uh, and those kind of things. And then he also included, or excluded I should say, um, any sales between uh, family members. So you really get a true what's called arm, arm's length transaction uh, data. And that's what those numbers in that table on page one represent going back over a, a five year period. And while we look at 2017, uh, there was about a thousand, and, and, and also then 35 acres or more. We're not looking at just a, a few acres here or there that can really be highly variable, but true uh, commercial uh, ag, bare land ag sales um, sold in arm length transactions. So in 2017 in Wapaka County, uh, that value. Uh, which, by the way, uh, was reported from 19 different transactions, uh, just under a thousand acres total, uh, was 33.57. Now, when you look back at 2016, you go, "Oh my goodness, that's about $500 an acre less," and it is about a 12% uh, reduction. But as the old <coughs> saying goes, "One year does not make a trend." If we look back over that five-year period, that $3,357 an acre for bare ag land um, was within $100 of that five-year average. So uh, by and large, uh, the uh, land values uh, have remained relatively steady. You can take a look. The trend's a little different in some of our neighboring counties. Shano County um, kind of uh, fighting the trend a bit. The land values have continued to increase there. Um, but you look at Outagamie County and uh, those land values, uh, there was 12 transactions, by the way, of, of over 600 acres of, of 35 uh, acres or more bare land in Outagamie County. Uh, 
you know, that's a 20% reduction between 2016 and 2017. So, um, again, maybe it's just smaller sample size that, uh, that is affected. And I should mention in Wapaka County, as you all know, there's a real difference between east and west in soil type. And, and I'm pretty confident if we were to look at that uh, sale data even more closely within the county, we'd probably see um, even uh, lower value for some of the lighter ground to the west and, and, and yet higher value to some of our better producing ground uh, from the central uh, to the east. The bottom part of that article um, then relates that to uh, land rent. It's a common question that I get, um, what's land renting for? Well, we can look back historically and know what rental rates were and then a take that as a percentage of what land value was. And if we look back uh, historically, our, our land rental rates have been between about two and a half and three and a half percent of, of land value. So if we take that land value of $3,400 $3, an acre and apply that uh, two and a half, three and a half percent, that puts us in the range, uh, uh, you know, somewhere of that 80 to 100 and Ten, one hundred and twenty dollars an acre as a as a average. Of course, there's no piece of property, uh, there's no uh, rental agreement, there's no real estate transaction that is average. Uh, but it does help folks get a little better idea of uh, where we stand, both uh, in terms of land values as well as uh, land rates. This was an article that I had shared in my uh, quarterly newsletter. Uh, to the ag community uh, earlier this year. So uh, with that, I'd be happy to answer your, any questions you might have. Questions? Okay, thank you very much. You're welcome, thank you. Okay, we're on item C, Highway Department 2017 Annual Financial Report. Mr. Byersdorf. All right. Good morning, County Board. Good morning. Good morning. So annually, the Highway Department Commissioner will address in three different steps the financial report of how we did the year prior. So step one is essentially um, myself and my office manager review our financial report with our Highway Committee. The Highway Committee approves it at that level before it gets put into a binder, which you're holding now. And then from there, I would take that binder and I would present it to the Finance Committee, and we may catch something that may be correct or incorrect in it, which we did. So in your yellow handout, you should have a green insert. Um, the green insert is essentially replacing page 25 from your spiral bound book. It's a minor, I mean, it's a major uh, catch, and I thank Heidi for thoroughly going through it with us, but a lot of numbers to potentially be transposed. Um, so then the final process of this financial report is for me to present it to the county board. And it tends to be a quick, rough, rough and dirty. You go through it pretty quick. Um, and then if you have any additional questions, please follow up with me at the end. Um, or I can get some help from Heidi if there's something that I may stumble on. But um, write your question, keep your questions for the, for the end, please. So we're going to begin with going through it page by page. The first page is just a breakthrough of who we are. We're the Wapaka County Highway Commission. It lists who is on the Highway Committee, who our office staff manager is, who oversees the construction operations, and then it gets down into who oversees our equipment and buildings. Let me flip over to the next page, where the top of it essentially says County Highway J at Thole Road. This page is essentially all of our capital projects. It's a different fund than our maintenance projects. It's our large construction, whether it's moving earth or just asphalt paving. So this is a breakdown of the projects we worked on in 2017. It lists all of them, essentially equaling $4.2 million worth of costs associated with them projects. Um, take note in 
2016, we essentially spent $3.4 million. So we were about $800,000 more spent in 2017. And it had a lot to do with spending down the bond amount of money that had been borrowed the three years prior. So there was a trend where the Highway Department and Finance Committee and County Board was bonding for construction projects. And 2017 was the end of that bonding. So we had to essentially spend down them bond dollars. So that's where it came up to be. Um, we had a approved budget before we went into 2017 of 3.9 million, and we essentially spent 4.2 million. Well, throughout the year, there was a $500,000 transfer, and maybe the finance committee could help me with understanding that, but it was to it, get more of our second mats of asphalt put on our roads rather than just putting on the, the binder mat and not fi finishing the project. Below that of our capital projects is a breakdown of just what we spend on maintenance of our projects, or maintenance of our entire county system. Um, essentially, we spent $3.3 million maintaining um, what we've got. Not building new, but just potholes, snow plowing, and all the costs accrued with just maintaining our infrastructure. Next, we'll flip over to the, the, the page where you'll see my signature on the bottom right. That's a breakdown of all of the state maintenance that was the state of Wisconsin hires Wapaka County to perform. It's, um, it's a breakdown of anything from asphalt to concrete repairs, the list goes on and on, right down to patrol supervision. Um, generally the, the state will, will hire us, will sign a contract with the county for a certain dollar amount and then our staff along with the DOT leg man that visits us once a week, monitors that budget throughout the year. Um, essentially, we spent $2,086,278 million, $2 million with Wisconsin DOT last year, of which 21000 of it was a performance-based maintenance project. So that's an additional project that the state hired Wapaka County to perform. Um, next, we're going to get into a bunch of pages of it, it basically says you got to flip your book to the side. Page one, it's uh, yeah, our equipment operations. And without going through page through page, let's please skip to page nine, which is a summary of our equipment operations. And I can explain page nine a little bit more thoroughly. Everything we do and every piece of equipment we own at Wapaka County at the highway department is assigned a state rate. The Wisconsin DOT essentially sign, assigns that rate to us, and that's the rate that we use to charge back to the state when we do state work, what we charge ourselves for county work, and what we charge for town work. That rate is set by the Wisconsin DOT. And they have their committees and so, so forth that do that. Well, each piece of equipment throughout the year has expenses, such as um, changing blades on a plow truck, changing the oil on it, maybe something got broke or damaged that needs to be fixed. So overall, you're, you're taking each piece of equipment in these pages one through nine and trying to sum up overall on the grand total bottom, way in the, way in the bottom where it says $346,686. When our staff or our crews using that equipment fill out their time on time card, it gets billed to a project, which is a rate set by the state. Now, Depending on how efficient we can be breaking equipment or being um, aggressive with it or just not maintaining it, the expenses could increase quite high. So overall, we had a profit of $346,686.99 to the good. That's a good thing because that profit essentially goes into a pool that along with the depreciation of our equipment builds a pot of money and that's how we replace our equipment year after year. So understanding how the profit plus depreciating builds this pot of money for Wapaka County Highway to replace its older trucks. Um, so overall, 11% profit on our equipment. That's, that's essentially good. Um, businesses typically are looking for 5% just to say that they're making a profit. Flipping to page number 10, you're looking at your buildings and grounds operations. And the, it's basically all of Wapaka County Highway Department buildings and grounds to include parking lot maintenance and anything that is essentially owned by Wapaka County Highway. Now, 
highway department functions as a separate um, um, enterprise from my understanding, and correct me if I'm wrong, Dwayne, but we have to report separate. So the highway commissioner does report every two weeks to the highway committee on the current financial status of the highway department. We're not waiting once every six months or so forth. So these, these numbers are constantly being evaluated, um, I would say, day in and day out with every report. Looking at the buildings and grounds operations portion of it, um, way at the bottom right, we essentially spent $414,152 in order to maintain the facilities that we have. It includes everything from highway administration, um, shop operations, fuel handling, equipment storage, and maintaining our asphalt parking lots, just with our buildings and grounds. Um, there's a lot involved with, with, with calculating that number. Next, we'll flip over to page number 11. It's talking about highway administration. It's the administration or oversight of the highway department, more or less big, bigger management staff. So on here, you'll see in labor, the highway commissioner charged $85,796 towards administrative um, um, costs. Now, my wage is more than that. That means that I probably charged my, some of my time to a county section or I was going to work for a township and giving them some, some chargeable time. Um, so that's where that dollar amount is figured in. Right below it where it says other labor, that includes my management staff in the office. Chris, my office manager, her wages are involved in there. Sue, Lisa, and Jan um, essentially are accountants to process all of the data that comes in administratively from receiving, um, <coughs> receiving checks to sending out bills. And a certain percentage of that rate is calculated by calculating our fringe benefits. And you're looking at benefits for um, vacation, birthdays, safety, show to, uh, safety shoe toe allowance, um, all of the different fringe benefits of having an employee beyond their, their straight time. Um, the commit, every committee receives a per diem, that's calculated in there. The commissioner's vehicle is included in that. Um, essentially moving on all the way to the bottom, uh, annually we get audited to ensure that we're meeting DOT standards and that them costs are $5,500, which is why we need to continually monitor our books. Um, overall costs in our highway administrative staff are $337,000. Flip into page number 12, um, there's additional administrative and other expenses. It includes what I would consider more minor expenses, such as radios um, and patrol, super, patrol supervision. So last year, or in 2017, um, our operations manager, Lance, retired, and then Greg Floor came on board. When you're seeing labor of $131,000, approximately 55% of what they perform, or what they're paid to provide services to Wapaka County, is paid for by us. The other 45% is reimbursed by the state. So, them two supervisors, my operations manager and my assistant operations manager, essentially are half is paid by the county and half is paid by uh, the state of Wisconsin. So that's where that 131 is reflected in just the county's costs. So overall, total patrol supervision costs was 247,000. Uh, I'm sorry, 243,000. <coughs> the year before was 281,000. Um, you move over to the right. There's a small number of 478 dollars. For the local road improvement program, that's costs incurred with administrating the state's local improvement pro process, and then below that is local bridge aids, which there's a program within our highway department where we have monies levied, set aside, and put away each year for bridge uh, bridge maintenance. And townships, municipalities that contribute to that can essentially pull out of it if needed, and it has to be a certain requirements approved by committee. That was only $3,552.28. A um, little bit below is a decreased um, vested sick vacation leave calculated by our finance department. Um, so I won't go too far on that. Next one is page 14. Our fuel handling rates are, um, are 
basically we're good. That's all the costs inclu included with having essential, essentially four fueling stations for our highway department within Wapaka County, and they're located at all of our satellite shops. Um, to, to own and operate and have ins inspected and distribute fuel to construction projects, to include the fuel truck, has a cost with it. So when we're selling fuel to other county departments or we're selling fuel to the New London School District, that's helping us generate a uh, dollar amount to cover the expenses with just having them services. We basically over-recovered last year $6,868, um, which, is, which is good. It wasn't as good as the year before, but it's a profit. We didn't go in the hole. Next, moving to page 15 is the uh, shop operations. Um, shop operations essentially is what it takes in order to have a staff to maintain our equipment and to have that, I think we have uh, nine full-time uh, mechanics on board with one supervisor and then we have a buildings and grounds and fleet manager that oversees the whole section of shop operations in our buildings. So if you're looking at where we were way at the bottom, total shop operations to be allocated with a dark line underneath it was $414,519. Um, essentially then that number needs to get approved and we can then generate a shop overhead rate to cover them costs for the, the next year, which is, was 75%. Moving to page 16 is the distribution of shop overhead at year end based on direct shop labor and fridge benefits. Notice you'll see the same number of 414,000 um, and then the labor in the column of 551,000. It's generating that shop overhead rate of 75% to pay for them employees um, basically working on the equipment. When our employees work on the equipment, they charge their time. The time gets charged to that piece of equipment, which is an expense on it. So that machinery has to keep moving in order for it to generate revenue to cover the costs of the expenses of maintaining it. Page 17 is a reconciliation of current year ends depreciation. Um, there's Basically, you're being told the same story twice. It's just in different ways. So up on top where it says annual depreciation, um, that is essentially telling the, state, it's the same story as the section down below where it says depreciation expense distribution. Um, they're telling, telling you the same story. But we have to depreciate our equipment and our buildings and grounds um, just because at some point it becomes invaluable once it becomes 20, 30, 40, 50. Highway shop, 85 years old, so um, it loses its value and then it doesn't depreciate out. So having new equipment essentially is a good thing and a bad thing. It could be a bad thing because it costs a lot to acquire it, but now you have a new piece of equipment that can depreciate, which generates money into the pot, which helps you purchase new equipment later on. So there's a balance to that. Moving to page 18, we've got our pit and quarry operations. Right now the highway department is the operator of two different pits. Essentially our name is established on it. One is a pit um, known as the Teal Pit um, in the township of Little Wolf and Royalton right on that border. And then um, our other pit that our name is stamped on is essentially the um, Kalru Pit. And we're the operator of it at this point. It's just a small little area but we are responsible for the restoration of these pits when it comes time. Um, we do send staff into there to screen salt sand, to load aggregates, to, um, to work in these pits with time. And then that employee charges their time to pits, essentially. And then we try to, uh, try to make up them expenses of that employee's labor by selling salt sand. That's our main one. And um, patching mix to townships. Um, overall, we had a, a, a gain of $39,036.27, which then gets reviewed annually and helps set our sand salt prices for the year before, um, or the year, the next year. Page 19 is our bituminous operations. That's essentially asphalt um, and everything that we do with paving. In the year 2017, um, essentially we had a um, total cost we spent $2,011,282 in purchasing asphalt from um, 
not only a company here, you know, American Asphalt in Wapaka County, but we purchased through MCC, we purchased from Northeast Asphalt, depending on where the, the project location is, because the trucking costs start to exceed the value of just shopping out of, from, from one, one asphalt plant. Um, and then the credits essentially is where your construction budgets are reimbursing your, your asphalt costs. We had a gain of $87,308.38. So made some, some money back. And there's years where you could lose money. Um, just as a, a, a note, last year we paid 49,773 tons of asphalt in 2017. Um, we produced 800, or we basically used 853 tons of patching. Um, 2016 was much less. Um, we were at 32,000 tons of asphalt. So 2017 was a good paving year for not only my infrastructure or the county's infrastructure, but what we also did for townships and municipalities. On page 20 is a fringe benefit analysis breakdown. There's where I'm talking about all the different things of having an employee and fringe benefits associated with being a Wapaka uh, County uh, employee. Page 21, we have small uh, field small tools account. Um, field small tools accounts is anything that would include like shovels, rakes, um, survey equipment, anything that does not have a DOT approved rate that we can charge it to a project, we have to somehow acquire or be able to purchase it so we have a small a field small tools account. And with that, um, it, it's, it's basically a rate that gets calculated onto every single project that we do um, from the year before. So say for instance in um, 2016 I had purchased in materials $41,000 worth of small tools. Well, you'll see in this booklet 2017 for the materials we, we have $102,000 worth of purchase. We purchased over $60,000 more worth of small tools in 2017 than we did in 2016. So the reason being is I felt that it's valuableness to purchase high-tech survey software to assist my field crews was worth the cost, so we bought $60,000 with the GPS equipment um, just to make our jobs run more efficient. And you don't see it on the small tools um, account, but you'll see it on the construction end of it. So Next we're going to go to page uh, 22. It's just a breakdown of our inventory of our lands and improvements. It shows all the different um, land and improvement for, or improvements that we did. Um, next you'll go down and then it isn't just what we did in 2017, it's stuff that's on the books way back. I think the oldest one is to 1994. Um, page 23 is an inventory of our improvements other than our, our buildings. So you can see when we purchased our scales, certain doors, um, did maintenance on our parking lot in 2016 at, up at our Larrabee shop. Um, our book value of them improvements is 258000 and with time it depreciates to have no, no book value. Next is page number 24. It's inventory of our buildings. Um, this year in particular we're going to do an extensive um, re-evaluation of the square footages and the, um, um, everything involved with picking up shop and moving to another location and we want to make sure that we don't look back and ensure that our books are as accurate as they are before we move to the new highway facility. Um, next is your green insert which is page number 25. There was one clerical error um, if you're looking for it. It's way at the, the third line from the bottom where it says state funded shed Helvetia. On your spiral bound book the number got transposed. Your green sheet is correct. So. Um, seven million dollars is way off from the actual forty thousand four hundred twenty eight dollars so that was a catch we'll flip over into page number 26 um, basically the book value way in the bottom right is um, four hundred sixty nine thousand nine hundred thirty five dollars of of our, of our buildings and grounds take an account that we probably could sell it for more but because we had to depreciate it that's what its book value is at Next is page 27. Um, now you're getting into 
400 and I think I counted 420 or 408 pieces of equipment that the state says we can we can charge a rate to it. So this is a breakdown of it. So let's just skip to page 36, which is a summary of all of our all of our equipment. Um, it includes everything from our heavy our heavy um, construction equipment, our our dump trucks, our our graders. Um, our excavators, everything that we've got, all the way down to the attachments that go with that plow on that truck when it comes time to, to plow snow. Um, it's a lot. So page 36 is um, a breakdown of it. If you're, um, if you're interested in, in learning more about it, I can, I can try to, to help you with some of it. But overall, when we originally purchased everything that we have at the highway department, in the grand total, we paid $16.4 million, and then through its depreciation cycles, the book value, it's at $6.1 million. Page 37 is the machinery and equipment purchased in 2017. We get a budget given to us from the depreciation plus the, inch, uh, depreciation plus the profit margin of what we can, what we can buy, and it, it, it fluctuates within our cash value. Um, pot of money, so to speak, and essentially the highway committee gives me a permissions. Last year they gave us a permissions of $1.2 million to purchase equipment. You'll see that we purchased $1.3 million. Reason being is there's them three categories in there for performance-based maintenance projects. Them three performance-based maintenance projects are additional work that the we, we basically have a separate pot of money that we can purchase equipment from for performance-based maintenance projects. So. We bought a, bought a skid steer and attachments for now performing work out on US Highway 10 for concrete repairs. Um, page 38 is a uh, machinery and equipment that we've discarded. We have to get rid of some of the stuff that we find not necessary anymore. It's a breakdown of the values of that. Page 39 goes all the way down to chairs and workstations, equipment. We're going to heavily evaluate that this, that this year not only within the Wapaka shop, but we're going to go to our satellite shops. I'm hiring two interns this year that have been four-year employees with us now um, to help me with this, with this progress, which will satisfy a degree that they're trying to acquire at UW-Superior and UW-Stevens Point. Page 40 um, is the machinery and equipment that we sold um, rather than discarded. So some, sometimes you just can't sell it because it's junk. So, but stuff you can sell, you try to you try to ask the book value of it, and sometimes you don't get what you're asking. It goes on Wisconsin surplus. We tend to find our best value in, in, in selling it that way. Um, overall, we lost $16,607 worth of value, um, but we had to get rid of it. Page 41 is an analysis of materials and supplies. It's a breakdown of our inventory. Um, when it comes time to balance your books, on page 41, the very last column says physical inventory, and the third from last column says your book inventory. At the end of the year, your tons of sand charged might not match what's on the books. The number of nuts and bolts in your inventory may not match what's actually in the, in the jar versus what's on the computer. So there's a, there's a balance, and that's why it's important to inventory everything. Um, the state says it's good if you're 10% or lower in a difference, and the difference in our values this year is was 6%, so we're within 6% of our book versus actual uh, inventory. And that has a lot to do with the men charging their time out. It has a lot of uh, uh, sand, salt, um, making sure stuff doesn't walk away from the shop unaccounted for. Page 42 is a breakdown of state projects. I had to list all of them in here because they are on our books as state um, balances. Um, the first question I had was right up on top is why is the balance due December 31st, 2017 of $821,000 from the state? It's essentially because we were plowing snow in this November and December of 2016 and because we had bills sent out to the state, and when they stamped it on December 31st, they just hadn't paid their bills. DOT has never had an issue with, with paying their funds. So it looks like they owed us, owed us 821, but actually they just didn't pay us back for the invoices we sent to them, and the book basically closed on December 31st. Um, 
Way at the bottom of page 42, our performance-based maintenance says negative 96,000. Um, that's actually a good number. So why it says negative, I, I, it should say positive. We, um, we essentially have a balance of $96,000. Our highway committee is approved to keep that balance at right around 50,000. So we have essentially $46,000 to the good to buy more equipment with. So it's good. Page 43 is a breakdown of accounts receivable. Um, and it basically lists um, the balance that was due from December 31st, 2016 all the way until December 31st of 2017 and the expenditures and receipts of the municipalities that hired us to provide them, them public services. So it's, um, it's, it's essential that we have this within Wapaka County or the staff would significantly get reduced. Um, just because we can't charge all of our time and equipment to our county budget, it wouldn't, it wouldn't be able to handle it. Page 44 is accounts, re again, accounts receivable. The top one is from other departments. We provide services for Parks Department, Sheriff's Department, all, everyone pretty much. And then that's, that's essentially what they had spent with us, um, balancing the expenditures and receipts. Um, due from transportation services and capital improvement funds, we've got um, Basically, um, you, you can see what the books are there. Um, due from the school districts. Notice the New London school district is significantly higher than everyone else. It's because they're one of the only school districts that purchase fuel from us. So that's where their expenditures and receipts are so high, which is great for us because it helps cover our fuel handling fees. That's all I've got for the 2017 financial report. I hope that it informed the new six supervisors. And it's a lot. It's a lot to take in. So it's confusing at first, but it's I'm always I'm always at work or most of the time. So come ask if you've got more questions. Yeah, we don't need a uh, approval on this. This gets filed in the clerk's office. Any quick questions for Mr. Byersdorf? Mr. Petty. Oops. Are we at a point now, Casey, where if we were take on any more work from the from the various townships? That would we require us to hire more personnel? Yes, we're at that level right now. Um, just in the years last winter, we took on, I should say in the winter of 2016, we agreed to plow for the township of St. Lawrence without increasing personnel or staff. And then in the year 2017, we were hired to plow the township of Fremont without increasing our staff or equipment. Um, Snowstorm Evelyn was a huge uh, reminder as to don't take on any more because with them big snow events, we're swamped. We have, when we go out and plow, we've got 43 pieces of equipment within the entire county, whether it's a grader or a truck, and they are pretty much all assigned and busy on, on sections, whether it's a state, county, or town section. So I cannot provide more services at this time without increasing my staff and equipment, otherwise staff would come to work and not have a plow truck to, drop, to jump in to, to plow um, or I could hire the, I could buy more equipment, it's just that I wouldn't have the staff. So if I'm going to take on more, I got to increase the size of the department's e equipment and staff and it's, it's, it's there, it's coming. I've got the requests to, to become larger and larger and larger so it could significantly grow here if approved by the different departments. If I want to increase my staff, I have to go through the Human Resources Committee. If I want to increase my um, equipment purchasing budget, I have to take that through highway and then through finance and then get that approved. So I just can't say yes, we're going to take on that additional services. But right now, we don't even have spare trucks to go around to all of our shops if one should break down. So we are content to just stay as status quo? We are doing fine where we're at right now. Um, it's a matter of big picture planning. If, for instance, a company wants to close their doors and four townships in our county don't have a service provider to plow snow for them, that's a big decision to make as a county, county board level decision, in my opinion, or a big committee level. Because if they're going to ask us for the service and I'm going to tell them no, it ain't coming from me, it's coming from you guys. <laughs> Yep, um, I'm content. I'm content with taking on more work, but that's me. Mention how much it cost of that snowstorm. 
um, I have some figures for the snowstorm. Snowstorm Evelyn essentially um, on our county budget, we budget one million dollars just to plow our county roads and in order to plow our county roads, we budget $1 million. Essentially, we're at that budget right now, and we still have to plow October, November, and December. It's not a huge red flag. It's just we are at our, our dollar amount. Um, Snowstorm Evelyn, so to speak, just on plowing our state, county, and town roads just for Saturday and Sunday. It wasn't Monday or Tuesday, Wednesday, and all the pushing them back was 197000 So there are $100,000 days that we were, we were going. And that's all time and materials and charging the equipment out to, to provide them services. So it was a, it was a lot. A five-year average of plowing in October, November, and December is right about $250,000. So I have to come up with $250,000 to plow snow in October, November, and December. I could take it out of my permanent maintenance, which is considered potholes, wedging, chip sealing, all of that. Or I cut all of that stuff and I just say, we aren't doing no permanent fixes on our roads. We're just going to maintain um, the temporary maintenance, which is plowing snow and watching it melt and go away. It's like watching your money leave you. So that's my thoughts. Uh, Mr. Fleece, you're lit up. No? No, okay. <laughs> Mr. Hendrick? Yeah, looking at these trucks again, you've got two tandem uh, axle trucks, Kenworths. One is a little over fourteen thousand dollars higher than the other one. Page thirty-seven. Ah, uh, thirty-seven. This white isn't working. Yep. So what happened is when we discarded one of our old tandem trucks, the the box on it was in really good shape. So we sold that. I believe it was a shot engine and a crack chassis. It was just a. The, the truck wasn't no good, but the box was in really good shape. So when we purchased the new trucks. We took an old box valued at $14,000 difference and we put it on a new chassis and cab and that's the difference in them purchases. Okay. Thank you very much, Casey and your, your staff for a great job. Thank you. Now we go to the Highway Special Building Committee presentation. Testing, testing. No picture in the connection. No. Try that now. Testing, testing. So before I get started with this project and our admin and our crews are, are trying to get the computers to work, I want to mention to you that um, um, being in the service for 20 and a half years and just what's going on with the change of staff, we've got some new supervisors in here. It's similar to being a non-commissioned officer in the service. Your non-commissioned officers <coughs> essentially are your sergeants, your guys that have been there for years and years and know what's going on. And every once in a while you get a new lieutenant. And the new, new lieutenant essentially has to be put underneath the wing of, of the new NCO so they understand how the, the project's running. There's six of you in here that probably are really wondering what's going on. I know that I've gotten a lot of questions from the existing board and that, that and the questions have been taking place for about a year and a half. Um, it's a huge project that we're undertaking and we're going to give a presentation on where we sit today with the project. Um, and then if you have any questions, um, this is specifically Steve and I are going to sit, sit back here to answer individual questions after this. So, Daryl, your tablet shows you want to speak. So Thank you. And I apologize. I'm not going to email the screen up. So this is the screen we're going to have to ask. Okay. So as I'm going to give introductions to begin this presentation, I would like to say that I presented this to the Special Building Committee. There is a committee that this team reports to. Our Special Building Committee reported on January 2nd, and then we reviewed our next Special Building Committee was on May 3rd. Um, so then we've, we've essentially su somewhat rehearsed this presentation, but there's a lot, a lot other questions you may have, please ask. I'll give introductions first. Um, 
with me um, on my core planning team is Chris Carlin, my office manager. She's instrumental in ensuring that the admin and administrative portion of this project is recorded somewhere and kept in a binder. And she's then the link between our financial director, myself, um, and the rest of the committee for the hanging onto the paperwork. And my filing cabinet is growing with this project. In addition, I have got um, Greg Floor, who's our operations manager. He's given us insight with this project from usage of, of um, traffic flows and um, salt shed designs. And he's, a, he's new to the department, but yet he brings some value experience looking at it from a civil engineer's side point of view. My experience is bringing it from 10 years at Shawano County and then the few years that I've had with Wapaka County. But we can't do it alone, so with that, I'll introduce Steve from Bray. Steve is the architect designing the Wapaka County Highway Department. He is part of a big staff that Bray Architects is split between is it two different offices, Milwaukee and Sheboygan, and, Sheboygan. and um, he is basically following up on the Space One Space Needs study that was started last year from Bray Architects. Michael Hacker, you've all met many times, um, he is the glasses tall guy. Um, he essentially is the businessman, gets us rolling, and then he'll assign an architect from his staff, and then we're fortunate enough to have Steve on board for the design. He's part of our core planning team that we meet every week. If some, sometimes we meet more than once a week. All right, thank you. With that, I've got Paul from Myron. Um, I'm gonna let him give introductions, but Paul essentially is our construction manager. So Paul, please introduce you and what, you're, what you do here. Thank you, Casey. Uh, Paul Reeder from Myron Construction, Senior Project Manager, and I've been in front of your group two or three times already. Uh, I'm the guy who kind of puts it all together, stands in the background, makes sure Steve has got some drawings that are fit into our budget, and yet the time frame, uh, make sure that we are all in our budget, that we've got established, that you folks helped to get approved. Worked with Casey and his group. We're, we're good at listening. We've done uh, several of these different projects in different buildings, so we want to listen to hear what your county's needs are, what your county's wants are, and design for the design for the needs as best we can, and the wants are a little higher to see if we can afford those as well. Um, so again, it's listening, putting it on paper, working with Bray and with POB to keep the, the project online. Uh, you want to tell them about your groundbreaking? I'll let you spring that on them. And okay. <laughs> but with that, we've got uh, Jim, point of beginning. So we've hired an architectural firm, Bray, and then Bray sub-consults out to electrical engineers, um, plumbing engineers, structural engineers, and we have a civil engineer. So I'll let uh, um, Jim. Uh, good morning, Jim Lundberg with point of beginning. Um, I'm the lead civil engineer uh, for the design of the project. Our company, uh, initially from a site planning perspective, uh, we did the original uh, topographic survey and boundary survey. So what that is is a map of boundary of the property and the topographic, <coughs> excuse me, portion of it is the elevations of it so that we can use that uh, when we're laying out the design and creating the new proposed grades and drainage. Um, so what we did is work with the core uh, planning team to take the puzzle pieces of the needs and lay them out on the site from a, a planning perspective as well as planning for drainage and, and uh, utility extensions, things like that. So, Okay, so our timeline from here, um, we can go into that, but first of all, I'd like to, for all of you to hear the presentation of each one of these, um, these departments or sections of the project, and then I'll break out some timelines afterwards. So kicking us off will be Bray Architects. Good morning, everyone. Um, again, Steve Yeager from Bray Architects. Um, Bray Architects, along with our team of engineers, civil engineers, electrical, plumbing, structural engineers, have been working with the uh, Wapaka County Highway Department over the past four or five months to plan the facility. And uh, we've hit some milestones that I'd like to uh, tell you about, and that is that the the property that the facility will be on has been successfully annexed into the city of Opaca in the last uh, several last month. Um, 
And we are now awaiting a, a draft memorandum uh, understanding for the extension of utilities to the site. That would be uh, city water and sewer. Um, <clears throat> we have made a submittal to the plan commission, the city of Opaka plan commission. Um, and we are waiting for a June uh, meeting to uh, get the, receive their report from the, the plan commission. Um, so um, I'm going to jump right in and, uh, well, no, I think, should we talk about the site first? Let's talk about the, the property, the site, and how we're improving that. Then after that, I'll jump back in and talk about the building itself. Um, I know it's been a long morning. I'm gonna try, we're going to try to keep this fairly brief, but we're going to stick around after the meeting to talk about anything in detail, as much detail as you'd like. Hello? Okay. Oh, there we go. Here we go. All right. Um, I, I wanted to piggyback a little bit on the uh, approval process with the city. Um, we submitted uh, for site plan approval last Monday, May 7th. The uh, targeted plan commission meeting date is June 13th. And they would act upon the uh, <laughs> Test. Okay. Um, so uh, with that, so the June 13th meeting, uh, another piece to the annexation is the city does not have a zoning designation for a facility. The city doesn't have a, a designation currently for a facility like this type. So what they're procedurally doing is creating a new zoning designation. Uh, and that's happening uh, this month and next month. And then once that's ultimately created, then the parcel would then be rezoned. Can you? Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Good. Um, so with that, uh, a rezone would uh, occur and the uh, parcel would then be zoned that new designation. So uh, I want to give you a brief tour of the site plan. Um, starting in the northwest corner, so as we're looking at the site, north is uh, up. Um, here is County Trunk Highway A. So as we come from the north, we are proposing a right turn lane into the facility. This would be our north driveway. As you enter the facility, um, as you look to your left, here would be the wash bay and vehicle storage garage. Uh, county salt shed, safe salt shed, and County Sand Storage Shed would be to the right. Uh, as you come around the site, there would be the uh, scale for uh, incoming, outgoing trucks to weigh in. Uh, we have a, to, as you move south to the right, uh, what we're indicating as cold storage is really just a, a unheated uh, storage for uh, vehicles, materials that don't necessarily need to be in heated storage, but uh, get them out of the, out of the inclement weather. Uh, moving further south, we do have storage bins to the right for materials such as tires and gravel, blind rock, cold patch, um, that sort of thing. To the left hand side would be the maintenance uh, garage. Then further south, we have uh, what we're calling gravel storage area. What that is is really just a gravel surface, and it's storing storm sewer, manholes, that sort of material that can be stored uh, exterior uh, to the facility. Uh, next to that, to the west, is what we're proposing for storm our stormwater management basin. 
uh, it's uh, lower in elevation in that location, so the entire site from a drainage perspective will be captured in, in storm sewer and conveyed to that stormwater facility to meet state and local uh, regulations where it, where it relates to treatment of stormwater and rate control of discharge of the stormwater from the, from the site. Um, moving further east along the south side of the facility, we have the fuel station. Um, we have the parking area north of that. There would be staff entrance here. Uh, we have deliveries and refuse recycling here. Uh, and the main visitor entry would be located here. Uh, the secondary or uh, visitor entrance on the south side would also have a proposed right turn lane uh, for entering the facility. Um, with that, I will turn it over. with Bray Architects. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the building and Jim uh, clued you in a little bit that there are kind of four functional areas of, of the building and that is to the north is the, the wash bay. That includes uh, a manual wash bay, an automatic wash bay, plus an area where the, uh, the county makes brine that gets uh, put onto the, the highways. Um, then, then the largest bulk of the building is really the vehicle storage or vehicle garage. Um, then we have this area right here is, is a repair shop. Uh, repair bays, service bays, the, the lifts for the various uh, sizes of trucks, and a fabrication shop where they uh, work their steel and turn it into amazing things. Uh, finally, <clears throat> at the front, uh, to the southeast is the administrative offices. Those are offices, conference rooms, some storage rooms. Um, zoom in a little bit here, sorry about that. Uh, bathroom facilities, as well as for the employees, uh, the, the truck uh, drivers, the uh, uh, snow plowers, um, a break room, a uh, cafeteria that uh, doubles as a training facility. Uh, they do have a locker room with shower facilities and bathrooms. So that's kind of the administrative services portion of the building along with repair, vehicle storage, and uh, wash, wash base. I'm going to set this down. This is um, a model of the, uh, the facility in three dimensions. Can you hear me? <laughs> I need all my hands here. Uh, so what we have this is this is that uh, that wash bay in the back, the vehicle garage, the repair shop, the cold storage or non-heated uh, storage building out on the site, and uh, and the administrative. Uh, offices. So this, this is really the appearance of, of the main entry into the office, the appearance of the, uh, the employee entrance and the, the break room, training room for, for the uh, vehicle operators. So obviously with, uh, with big trucks you need a big building. Uh, height is important uh, so that you get the proper clearances, uh, large garage doors. We're trying to bring natural light into the building so that, I apologize for the flashing, that's just, um, there are skylights and, and uh, windows even in the repair, excuse me, the repair and the vehicle storage for natural light. Um, the, uh, the materials, we can show you some, why don't we talk about that after the meeting if you'd like. Uh, I can talk about the brick, uh, the, the precast concrete, 
that are all the materials that go into the building. So um, that's kind of a brief overview. You've had a big agenda this morning. I think I'll, I'll leave it at that. And uh, you are welcome to ask any questions after the meeting. All right, Steve, thank you. So the next, the next thing that we're going to do is we got to put the plans together, the specifications together, and it's got to get bid out. So we can't do that until we're finalized with the design. I would say we're roughly about 90% done with the design, 90% done with the site plan, 90% um, done with the city annexing portion. Them three were the big ticket items. From there, we can put these documents out for competitive bidding. Um, that's going to occur. Um, end of July in that time frame. Um, prior to that, our highway department is going to self-perform some of the work to include the rough site grading, which is roughly um, $800,000 worth of earthwork just to balance this site. We've teamed up with Wapaka Foundry and where they're going to be hauling in a beneficial reuse sand um, for fill materials. We're not purchasing it. In fact, they're going to pay us to place it. Um, that's a joint project we're doing with the foundry. In addition to that, once the facility is done and it's graveled and it's ready to go, our crews will be self-performing the $600,000 worth of asphalt paving included in it. So roughly $1.3 million will be self-performed work from the highway department. So items that are going to get bid out are anything from, um, was it sections 1 through 11, right? Yeah. 1 through 11? 26. One, yeah. 1 through 26. One might be grading, one might be concrete, one might be steel, one might be wiring, blah, blah, blah. It goes on and on. There's 26 different subcategories to bid out. And so we're creating the documents between now and uh, July. And then we're going to have bid openings where we take all these documents in the basement of the courthouse, lower level 43, on um, Wednesday, August 15th, day after elections, um, to ensure that we gather all this data. Um, at that point, that's when the special building committee is going to reconvene, see where we're at. It won't be a day where they can throw up balloons and celebrate the cost. It'll be gathering the data. Then it's going to be up to the construction manager to consolidate what was bid, what the value of it, to see if the contractor can provide the services that we were asking for, and then we choose who we're going to hire for the highway department. So long process in there. Um, it's the goal of our department right after the 4th of July to start stripping topsoil and moving earth around. And then we're anticipating a groundbreaking ceremony on, was it July 13th or July, July 19th? And there will be media day um, taking pictures of the gold shovel going in the ground and construction helmets and all of that type of stuff. So moving forward pretty fast. Overall, when it's all said and done, I would like to be operating with our crews out of this shop by November of 2019. So that's the goal is to plow this next winter out of our existing facility and then move into the new one before the winter of 2019-20. Make sense? Okay. That's the breakdown of our presentation. Um, if you have any other additional questions, I can take them, but it's almost noon. So after this, I'll meet with Steve and, and yourselves. How about three questions? Good. Okay. Mr. Murphy? Oh, your no. request to speak was on if you wanted to turn it on. I don't know how it got on. Gerald, you're just on. Do you want to do this? Just hit your cancel. Yeah, Joyce, Joyce, you're just on. Yes, I did. Okay. Uh, I think way back when you were first talking about this, there was going to be some type of a meeting room as you first come in that could be kind of blocked off from the rest in case we had after our meetings, like for Health and Human Service, we wouldn't have to have the courthouse open. That it could Is that still in there? Yes, it is, Supervisor Boyer. What we're going to do, is, or what we have designed is You'd be able to walk in the front entrance. This store would be locked. There's a gate that drops down over the transition counter. Engineering specialists, office manager, and commissioners, uh, offices are all locked. And then this would be access to this plan room and committee room. And it would be more than Department of Health and Human Services. It could be townships, right. Wisconsin DOT, planning meetings, all kinds of stuff like that. And 
That's how we're designing it. But it more or less is going to be the east half of the building where they're still able to access the public restrooms. And if it's, they're going to feed someone or have snacks, they have access to the kitchen up on top. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else? One more? Time's up. I want to show you what the outside of the building is going to look like. Um, this is concrete with chips on it, and it's been beat up because we've been putting other blocks on it. But essentially, that's the color of the exterior of the building. Um, this sample came from Span Creek. It'll be competitively bid out with other potential suppliers, but this is the product that you'll see on the outside of the shop that uh, Bill Jolie picked out. <laughs> no. And then I would point out the, uh, the administrative offices are, are brick, and I do have color samples, I have the brick samples in the back. There, there are other materials, but the big, the big portions of the building are the precast concrete tilt ups. That's a, one of the more economical methods of facing the skin. It, it does two things. It's the outside wall. Well, Paul, you should use the microphone, otherwise it won't get here, please. Thank you. It, it, that product. Switch on. There go. The, the product itself does several different things. It acts as the outside wall. It's an insulated three inches of poly you insulation. You need to talk into the mic. Like no. Poly insulation. Can you hear me that way? It's not working. Can you hear it's a wash open. The wash. That's right. I thought my wife was in the wall. Yeah. Does that help? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, the precast wall panels are, are, we find, very, very good. On this type of a building, it acts as a wall, it's insulated, it's got the structural strengths, it also acts as bearings. So we can actually take the steel roof members, bear them on these, on a ledge that's cast into that. It's, it's quick, we can do it any time of year, basically for that, which helps us with the <laughs> schedule here starting in the fall. So we can do the concrete when it's nice, we do this kind of work when it's a little more inclement, and then we in the spring and the summer we can finish off the rest of the outside. It, it's it also a long-lasting, low maintenance. Yes, yeah. well, very. I mean, there's very low maintenance. Yeah, they're 50 years. I got some of these up like 30 years. They haven't done anything to the outside other than pressure wash, get some of the dust and dirt off of them in years, and it's it's a low maintenance. You don't have to seal them or any of that kind of stuff. So it's it's a very reliable product. That's the product we were trying to get you folks to approve, and two weeks ago we did. So thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. <laughs> So you're all going to just want to make sure that your iPads didn't go to sleep on you and, and set a program that you have to do. Okay, and in closing here, it's really late. Uh, county Board Chief. Uh, the last item here that uh, is on reports is my report that due to the time I won't say much but I will I have to mention this because it's near and dear to me and that's it's law enforcement week not that I was ever in law enforcement but we have at least three or four of you that have been in law enforcement sometime many of you have been in emergency government and as uh, chairman of uh, emergency government of Packet County I am a scanner listener I have been forever uh, back when I was in the city of Clintonville. I do have a scanner. I don't sleep up at, at, at much at night. I monitor it. If anything, anything, our sheriff's deputies have, have serious situations almost every night. Not once, but twice. It's just they're in danger. And I can't believe what all goes on at Wapaka County at night and many during the day. I give these men and women so much credit out there uh, that we have no idea uh, if anything, uh, the Sheriff's Department needs more people, and that's a budgetary thing, I know. But there were 135 men and women in blue that got killed in the United States last year. And, it's a, and a, some people think it's a thankless deal, but thank God for our law enforcement. And we thank, we see somebody thank them for their service. With that being said, we'll go on to appointments.
You want to read those, Clerk? Um, appoint Supervisor Jim Niger to the Highway Safety Review Board and Director Jeff Hall to the Highway Safety Review Board. Is there a motion for approval? Mr. Federowitz? So moved. There is a motion by Mr. Federowitz. Supervisor Laird? Second. And there's a second. Any questions? This question, I mean discussion, please vote. Please turn off your request to speak as well. Yeah, Fred, you have Fred and Jan. Thank you. Thank you. And Lima. He's gone. Okay, let me take that off. Dale. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. Thank you. Yep. Appoint yeah. Supervisor Dave Johnson to the Department of Health and Human Service Board. Mr. Dodd? I'm going to make a motion to approve uh, Dave Johnson being appointed to the DHHS Board. Okay, Mr. Dodd made a motion for approval. Mr. Murphy? Second that motion. And a second by Supervisor Gerald Murphy. Any questions or discussion? Please vote. Jerry and Fred, could you take off your request to speak? Thank you. Dave Jones. Jerry. Dave, let's go ahead, Bill. Jerry? Okay. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. Appoint Supervisor Gerald Murphy as Department of Health and Human Service Board Chair, Dave Newman as Department of Health and Service uh, Vice Chair, and Pat Craig as Secretary. Mr. Johnson? Motion to approve the three people persons. There is a motion by Mr. Johnson for approval. Mr. Fleece? I'll second that motion. And a second by Mr. Fleece. Any questions or discussion? Supervisor Johnson, can you turn off your request to speak, please? Thank you. Please vote. Mr. Will? It took a while. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. Appoint Dr. Stephen, I apologize, Bodez. Get us, um, Department of Health and Human Service Board Member Representative to the Birth Three Children's Community Options Program Committee. Okay, is there a motion for approval? Supervisor Craig? Move to approve. There's a motion by Supervisor Craig for approval. Do we have a second? Yeah, it's a it's discussion. Discussion. It's, it says it's there, so could you do it by hand and I will mo and I will. I'll second it. Yeah, so second by Supervisor Lair. Any questions or discussion? Please vote. I don't have that on my screen. I can't take it off. <laughs> I would Dick, like can you uh, vote in Terry Martin? I did. Oh, not sorry, Dick Rowan. Can you vote, Mr. Rowan? Supervisor Rowan? There. And. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. And one more. Appoint Supervisor John Lear, uh, County Board, Department of Health and Human Service Board Member Representative to the Nutrition Advisory Council. Supervisor Pullman? I'd move to approve Jan for that committee. There is a motion for approval by Supervisor Pullman to approve Jan. Mr. Nygaard? Second. And there's a second by Mr. Nygaard. Question your discussion. Please vote. Last chance to vote. Motion carries 24 to 0. Okay. Um, other than 
Okay, the announcements are in the back. You can read. Uh, let's thank Mr. Ellis for the delicious treats over there. Thank you. And with that, I just want Supervisor Boyer. I just wanted to thank Jill for being patient with all of us through this. And I think she did a great job. Yeah. I appreciate your patience. Thank you very much, everybody, for being patient with all of us. But it wasn't without Jill, and it wasn't without her knowing my screen and pushing for me, I, I would be back in the uh, uh, agenda yet. But I have to tell you that she was with Green Lake County that had this even though it's been some years ago. Three years ago. Three years ago. So thanks all for your patience and understanding. And uh, it was a great meeting, long meeting, a great meeting. I need a motion for approval. Adjourn. Adjourn. Uh, <laughs> Approved to adjourn. Uh, Mr. Hendrich? I move to adjourn. Okay. Mr. Hendrich moves to adjourn. Mr. Zog? I will second that. Really? Okay. <laughs> uh, please vote. Yeah. Yeah. Take you off, Jack. Don't worry. Hang on. And there we go. All right. Now we can get out. <laughs> now you can leave. You can leave. You're oh, your no. turn. Okay. Meeting's adjourned. Thank you. Thank you. It took 32% of my time.